ladies and gentlemen, Miss Scylla Black. Thank you. Hello and welcome. Well, we've got a really smashing show for you tonight. We've got surprises, songs, a choir and an ease up. And we're going to start with a surprise for a young lady sitting here who's a songbird at her local pub up there in Cheshire. Yes, surprise, surprise. It's you, Sharon Bunting. Would you like to come down and join me, please? Come on, Sharon. <laughs> Welcome to Surprise, Surprise. Thank you. Now, you'll never guess who wrote me a letter telling me all about you. <laughs> oh, yes, you're looking at her right now. Yes, it's your mom sitting up there. Oh, she, she's a mine of information. Is she? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you a killer? Yeah. Oh, Sharon, don't be like that. She writes and tells me that you've been singing ever since you were a little girl like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'd sing at the drop of a hat. <laughs> you used to go out with your granddad in his car and you'd have a little sing-song <laughs> both together. Yes, is that right? And last year, just for a day, just for a day, you got off at the local pub, is that right? Yes, I did. And ever since then, they thought you were the bees knees. <laughs> You've been singing every weekend there. Yes, Isn't that mad? <laughs> now, I know you've got a very favourite singer, haven't you? Very favourite Irish singer. Yes. And I don't need to tell you who it is. Yes, it's Daniel O'Donnell. Yes, it is. And your mum... Last year, as a belated 21st birthday party, she bought you a couple of tickets to go and see him at the Apollo in Manchester. That's right. <laughs> Which you did. I know everything about you, Sharon. <laughs> and he, indeed, he sang, well, maybe not one, but two songs to you during the show. He did. He did. Oh. <laughs> well, that must have been a marvellous surprise for you that night. Well, you know, anything your man can do, we can do better. Now, she may have arranged for you to see Daniel O'Donnell at the Apollo, but we've arranged for him to come and see you right here. And here he is, your favourite Daniel O'Donnell. Come in, Daniel. <laughs> oh, Sharon, say hello. Say hello to me. Hello, hello. And she's your number one fan, Daniel. Oh, I, I think I could be her number one fan. <laughs> oh, she's come over all unnecessary. <laughs> well, you're going to sing for us tonight, aren't you, Daniel? Yes, I am going to sing. What song are you going to sing? I'm going to sing I Need You. <laughs> <laughs> and this time, Sharon, he's not going to dead. I'm sorry, he's not going to dedicate this song to you. No. <laughs> No, because surprise, surprise, you were going to sing it with him. <laughs> oh, yes, indeed you are. How do you feel about that, Chuck? I don't know. You don't? Well, you're not going to do it right now, is she, Daniel? No, She's no, going to no. have a little yeah. gargle and a practice. Yeah. So off you pop with that. Daniel will look after you, and we shall see you later. She's absolutely shaking, Daniel. Take care oh. of her, ladies and gentlemen. Daniel and Sham, see you later. <laughs> All the nice girls love a sailor, and I know a certain sailor who's loved by girls and boys. She's Sue Day, fourth officer with the Nautical Training Corps in Portsmouth. Now, for the last 11 years, Sue has instructed the boy and girl cadets on the training ship Vigilant. When their marching band performs in public, Sue is there with a clothes brush and shoe polish at the ready to make sure all her cadets look ship -shaped. Second officer Peter Parker wrote to me on behalf of all the cadets to ask me if I'd thank Sue for the hard work and help she's put in all over the years. So off I went to the local chemist in Cow Plain near Portsmouth to give her the surprise of her life. Sue! Sue! <laughs> surprise, surprise, Sue Day. 
Or should I say, hello, sailor? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I hear you're very involved with naval activities. They tell me all your young cadets, your lovely cadets, think that you do a wonderful job and you say that you can do anything from a reef knot and you definitely know your port from your starboard mm -hmm. so they went up to your fellow officer Peter Parker oh, okay. <laughs> and they said please could you write a silla oh. they want me to deliver you a sillagram oh. well I think you should say hello to Peter Parker because he's, he's the one that did he, yes he wrote tell me all about you Come in, Peter. Come in, Chuck. There he is, the man himself. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you're finished? The day is only beginning. Because I, Peter told me, you did tell me, Chuck, that I'd make a good recruit. That's right, yes. yes. So, can I join your little band of cadets for the day? Mm. Well, come on, Sue. Shall we set sail? Yeah. <laughs> here we go, here we go, here we go. make a phone call to a 17 year old Mark Sanders. Now during this series I phoned all kinds of people who do all kinds of things and invited them on the show to do it here. I wanted them to teach me you see. Now I've played the bagpipes, I've rattled the bones, I've even iced a cake and I've joined in with a barbershop sing-along. You'll never guess what young Mark does. He's a juggler. <laughs> If you'll be out there watching, you probably think, well, that's not so odd. Well, how does this grab you? He juggles while riding a unicycle. <laughs> Do you know what? I'm dreading this. <laughs> anyway, here we go. You'll never guess how many digits there are this week. It's nine. It's nine. And here we go. <laughs> Don't be laughing, you put me up. <laughs> there we go. I hope he's not unicycled off somewhere. <laughs> oh, it's ringing out. <phone rings> Still ringing out. Hello? Hello? Hello, yes. Hello, can I speak to Mark Sanders, please? Speaking. Hello, Mark. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> well, surprise, surprise, Mark. 
pocket still are here. Oh, oh, hello. <laughs> Mark. Oh, he's very cool, isn't he? For a 70 year old. Now, Mark, I've been, I'm ringing you about your juggling. That's what I'm ringing you about. Oh, you are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, tell us a bit about it, Chuck. How long have you been juggling? A um, couple of years, last December. A couple of years? Yeah. Now, I hear you're very good. In fact, I've got a photograph here to show the audience what you look like juggling. And there he is. <laughs> oh, I think you're juggling with something quite dangerous. It looks a bit fiery to me. Do you juggle with fire? Um, occasionally, yeah. Well, the thing is, I want, I can, could you teach me possibly how to juggle? What, on the phone? And <laughs> <laughs> on the thin, I want you to come to the studio next week and teach me how to juggle. Oh, OK, yeah, sure. Now, I believe. <laughs> Wonderful, I love it, I love it. I believe you do it, juggling, that is, on a unicycle. <laughs> now, <laughs> I dare not ask this question. How big is your unicycle? Um, I've got a short one and I've got a... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you can't get the class of audiences these days. I'm afraid, you know. You've got a short one, and then I missed it because they all went hysterical. You've got a... The short one's seven foot. Now, so you do this juggling, and you do it on a unicycle. Well, you must be very clever. But, I mean, I do believe you are studying for your A-levels at the minute, aren't you? That's correct, yeah. Uh, will you be as cool, calm, and collected when you, you take your A's, or...? Yeah, yeah. this is my nature. It is your nature. Well, I hope it's in your nature to come on next week's show. Will you do that? Sure, yeah. Well, and it depends if I've got the time or not, but I'll try and fit you in. <laughs> so, uh, you're fixed for next week, then? Yeah, I'm all right, then, yeah. I'll come along. <laughs> Thanks for doing us a favour, Mark. I, you know, I do appreciate you coming on the show in front of 30 million viewers. I shall see you next week, Mark. All right, Chuck? Okay, then. Yeah. Ta-ra, then. Bye. Ta-ra. <laughs>he was he was so laid back he was nearly falling off to sleep during that wasn't he <laughs> you know i hope i've not done something i'll regret i know i have but I'll just have to think about that tomorrow but now changing the subject up there in chesterfield is a michael baker who's been the choir master at the parish church for the past 21 years now during which time he and his choir have given great pleasure to lots of people with their choral performances michael and his choir have never performed on television before but we're about to change all that because we sent our Bob Cowdges up to Chesterfield where he joined in the choir practice. Doesn't that sound lovely? That's marvellous. That. What a lovely sound. Michael, is it Michael Baker? It is. Hello, Michael. Surprise, surprise. Hi, <laughs> hey, everybody. We thought we, we actually would like to know if you could, uh, or really, help us out with a special surprise, surprise celebration night. Your friend, your friend, Barry Orton. Right. Has written in... <laughs> Just a minute, his son's there. <laughs> Has written and told us that you've been yeah. choir master here now for how long is it? Probably 20 and a half years. So nearly 21 years, isn't yeah. that most? And we know you've brought pleasure to audiences far and wide. In fact, you're planning another trip abroad, aren't you? Where are you going to? Uh, to the United States. To America. Yeah. Well, we thought... Of July. Really? But we thought, wouldn't it be a lovely idea? Right. If, if you did a special surprise, surprise concert for us, and hopefully at the same time raised uh, with our help a few extra pennies towards your American trip. Oh, we'd be delighted. Would you, would you, would you all fancy that? Yeah! Well, there's lots to do, you know, we've got posters to print, we've got yeah. tickets to sell, and we've got new songs to learn, so we better get busy, all right. later for a live performance and to find out how the fundraising has gone but now I've got a letter here and it's written on blue paper and it's called a bluey and I bet you didn't know that did you did you <laughs> no no you didn't but there's somebody sitting right here in our audience who knows all about blueys yes surprise surprise it's you Louise Dennison where are you Louise where are you Louise give us a wave oh she's right up there Louise come down and join me please Hello. 
Louise, have a sit down then. Make yourself comfortable. Well, Louise, I am right, aren't I? You know all about receiving all these blueies, don't you? Yes, I do. Because for the past nine months, you've been receiving these blueies from a certain young gentleman who's in the Royal Signals Regiment, is that right? That's correct, yeah. And you first started writing to him when he was serving in the Falklands, and more recently, when he was serving down at the Gulf. That's right. Now, tell me, how many, how many letters do you write to him per week? Well, when, when the war actually started, I tried to write nearly every day. Mm. Um, I saw sort of messages on the television saying that they, they were proving to be a great confidence booster to the boys, so I tried to write as often as I could. Yes, I want, oh, every day. Well, that's a lot, a lot of letters, you know. That's incredible. <laughs> and they were much appreciated because I actually got a bluey from private, yes, private agent Fadzilla. That's how you pronounce it, isn't it? Yes. And this is in his very own handwriting, and he tells me, well, he writes most sparkling things about you. He thinks the world of you, and he really did appreciate your letters, especially during the Gulf conflict. And he says, this is just a bit of the letter. I love receiving Louise's letters. I love to hear what she's been up to, and she really brightens up my day and makes me laugh. Ah. Oh. Isn't that nice? Well, I know you're hoping to meet up with Adrian for the first time. Now, when do you expect that to be? Well, originally, in one of his letters, he said he'd be home by the 24th of March. Um, I rang his mum on the 27th of March, and he's still not, be, still not got home. He's oh, been delayed. We can do much better than that. We can, because surprise, surprise, here he is, and you're going to meet him for the first time. <laughs> Don't have to send any letters tonight. Here he is, and he's a cracker. Oh he's a cracker. <laughs> Well, Adrian, and we were, I must tell you, we were ever, the whole world were ever so proud of you lads and the lassies down at the Gulf, weren't we, ladies and gentlemen? We really are. We're doing such a great job. Well, there she is, lad. That's our Louise. Watch it. <laughs> She's great. Come on, Louise, watch it. Isn't it? It's like being on blind date, isn't it? Well, I know, oh, I, I know you really appreciated the letters, and you've got a, an awful lot to talk about in person, but I know you're not going to do it on this show. You're going to do it in private. <laughs> Louise, you've gone kill all shy. <laughs> you'll, you'll kill him first. Oh, well, while, while you're killing him, we're going to take a break, so we'll see you in a couple of minutes. So please, boy. <laughs> back well right now we're gonna have a bit of rock no not the kind with blackpool written all the way through it a bit of rock and roll you see last week i phoned lynn webb who's been rocking and rolling ever since she was a kid and i invited her and her partner terry nethercott to come and give us a demonstration well here they are <laughs> <laughs> well, my, well, if you're going to have one, have a big one, that's what I say. <laughs> well, Lynn, oh, oh, but welcome to the show back again. He is a big lad, though, isn't he, for his mum? How tall are you, sweetheart? Well, six foot seven, Silla. Six foot seven? Yeah. My God. I suppose you've heard all the sort of, you know, the yeah. quips about you. What have you had? Well, How's the weather up cold up there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Lynn? I mean, you were partners, jiving partners, all mm. those years ago, and you had a lot of fun together. And now I've invited you to jive on the show again, all these years later on the show. Mm. Now, I believe you love jiving too. Well, the obvious, Bill Ailey and the Comets. Rock yeah. around the clock. Most of the audience. Yes, well, that's what you're going to jive to tonight. A little bit of Bill Ailey. Enjoy it. I know I will. Go to it.
Oh, we're all getting into that. We were all getting into that. Oh, you see, you're older than you look, you lot out there. You really are. Have you got any breath? <laughs> Just a bit. How did it feel, Jiving, after all those years? How was it for you, Terry? Wonderful, Silla, wonderful. <laughs> did the earth move? Absolutely. <laughs> it moved for us. Everything was shaking in here. You did ever so well. Thank, Thank you, you both much. very much. And also the girls and the boys here, they did a great job too, didn't they, ladies and gentlemen? Tell you, I did enjoy that blast from the past, but to bring us bang right up to date on this week's search line is our very own Gordon Burns. Well, from rock to rats, because I thought we'd start with a rat hunt tonight. Uh, but these rats we all admire. Desert rats from the Second World War. Frank Saunders from Kew near London wrote to Searchline telling us how he sat glued to the screen during the recent Gulf War and how the tremendous performance of today's desert rats brought the memories flooding back. In particular, he began to think a lot about his two best mates in the army back in the 1940s and wondered where they are now. Their names are Nelson Starling and Ginger Longley. Frank and Nelson Starling served together with the 1st Battalion Bedford and Hearts Regiment in Palestine at the start of the 1940s. And this picture was taken of the two of them in Jerusalem in 1942. Shortly afterwards, Nelson was posted to Iraq, and from that moment, all contact was lost. But in Jerusalem, Frank struck up another close friendship with a cook in the 1st 5th Queen's Regiment. Smart move, making friends with a cook if you're in the army. Well, in 1943, they both served in the Western Desert with the 7th Armoured Division and were part of the original Desert Rats. In fact, Frank still has his rat, but I'm sure he didn't bring it with him in 1944 when he was best man at Ginger's wedding in Croydon. So Nelson Starling and Ginger Longley, if you're watching, call Searchline and we'll put you in touch with Frank Saunders. Now, at just about the time Frank was serving out in the desert, Sylvia Woodward, then aged eight, moved to Falmer Road in Enfield, Essex. Very quickly, she became best friends with another girl who lived literally a stone's throw away. Now, we know that because the friend Maureen Howlett did hurl a stone from outside her own house at Sylvia. Well, actually, it was a brick, and it didn't miss either. Now, the reason for that unfriendly act was jealousy. A new girl had moved into Falmer Road, and Sylvia had become friendly with her. But Maureen soon made it up with Sylvia, and their friendship became even closer. They remained pals throughout their teens and until they each got married. Sylvia moved to Harlow with her husband in 1952 and lost touch with Maureen. Now, aged 57 and with nine grandchildren, she'd love to find Maureen again. So Maureen Howlett, once of 22 Falmer Road, Enfield, and later becoming Mrs. Slavini. If you are watching, be a brick and get in touch. <laughs> well, now to another story of friendship. Back in 1968, John Teagan, who lived at Latham Shanks Farm near Berwick-on-Tweed, found himself in desperate need of help when his wife became very ill and he had an 18-month-old son, Kevin, to look after. Their very good friends, the Nevins, responded immediately. For three months, they looked after little Kevin at their farm in Duns in Berwickshire. And Kathleen Nevins had such a fun time that when her own son was born, just a few weeks after Kevin had returned home, she called him Kevin. Sometime later, both the Nevins and the Teagans moved away from the area, and that's when they lost contact. But then, just six years ago, on a visit back to Duns, Kathleen bumped into an old neighbour who said that just the year before, Kevin had knocked on her door trying to find Kathleen. The neighbour didn't have Kathleen's address, and Kevin didn't leave his. So let's hope Searchline can do the trick. Kevin Teagan, if you're watching, or indeed if anyone watching can help with tonight's stories, please call us on the Searchline number 071 8070. I shall be back later with more Searchline, but now, Silla. Thanks a lot, Gordon. We shall see you later. And now it's time to join the concert goers at Chesterfield Parish Church for a choral interlude. I wonder where our master of ceremonies is. Are you there, Bob? Yes, we're here, Silla. Live and well. Oh, I can see that. Oh, and don't you look a picture there in your dicky bow and everything. Your mum, got, your mum got me ready. Oh, did you? How's the concert going, by the way? Well, actually, you've joined us in the interval. Uh, only just in time. We uh, haven't long finished um, the first half of it. Uh, this special uh, charity concert. We've had the beautiful singing of the Chesterfield Parish Choir, you can see behind me. Ah. Marvellous too, wasn't it, audience? Yes. Oh, lovely. <laughs> and they're so excited now because this is their first time on TV, Silla. Oh, looks... well, give everybody a wave, lads. Give a wave. <laughs> and they have 
have been wonderfully conducted by our, our choir master and our staff this evening, Mr. Michael Baker. Hello, Michael. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Well, I'm very well. And what do you think of our Bobby in your MC? Has he done well? Bob has been as fantastic as always, Sarah. <laughs> Moving swiftly on, I should tell you, Sarah, that the Surprise Surprise medley has been specially written by Michael and Andrew Marples from the choir. There he is. Tell us about what, it, what is in the medley, by the way. Well, I'll, I'll do the formal announcement and say, ladies and gentlemen, the Chesterfield Parish Choir, conducted by Michael Baker, will now perform their Surprise Surprise choral medley. <laughs> say that was absolutely beautiful all the kids and the grown-up fellas at the back there the choruses at the back that was absolutely superb and thank you very much indeed for a wonder I love that surprise surprise thing I did it was absolutely smashing will you come on the show next week and do it at the top for me we will <laughs> <laughs> Bob I, I think you better tell Michael the good news Yes, I have just been handed the card to tell us how much we have raised uh, tonight at this wonderful event. And it is, in fact, Michael, and a very nice figure. It's £1,243. Oh, terrific. Marvellous. Yeah. Well, Michael. I hope that sees Michael on his way, a little bit on his way to America. In July, did you say it was? Yes, in July, last week in July, and we're looking forward to it, and we shall get there. And thanks for all the help you've given us tonight. Oh, you're very welcome. And are the Americans in for a treat? Oh, you're going to love it then. They're going to adore you. That's I right, think that's sorry. absolutely fabulous. Absolutely right. But I'm afraid we, uh, we must get ready to start our second half now. So it's about time we said cheerio, Silla. Oh, with deep regret, because I was enjoying the lads and everyone there. Have, have a great rest of the evening to you all. And, uh, Bob, I shall see you next week. See you next week, Silla. Good luck, lads. Good luck in America. Ta-ra, then. Ta-ra, everyone. <laughs> We're going to 
take a short break ourselves now, but we'll be back in a couple of minutes to see a great granny walking on her, yes. We'll have more from Gordon and an Irish love song, and we'll have a very special surprise for someone sitting right here in our audience tonight, so see you in a couple of minutes. Welcome back. Now, remember I said we were going to see a granny walking on her. Did you? Yes. Super. Well, a couple of days ago, our Bob went down to Sussex, and it turned out to be a hair-raising experience. Have a look at this. That's right, Silla. And it's going to be hair-raising in more ways than one. You see, inside this house behind me is Hilda Fairchild, who's having her hair done by her daughter, Anita. Now, Anita has written and told us that her mother, who is a great-grandmother, has a very much a daredevil streak in her, and she'd love nothing more than to stand on the wings of an aeroplane flying through the air. It's called wing walking. So, we'll go and see if she's ready for takeoff. Hope we don't spoil the hairdo. I think we might, though. This could be, this could be where Hilda is. Yes, it is definitely Hilda Fairchild here. <laughs> Hilda! How are you, Chuck? Hilda Fairchild, turn around on this lovely swivel chair. Surprise, surprise, Hilda. I just think it is. <laughs> oh, right. Love the haircut, that's very, very nice. <laughs> Now, please, let me wait, tell you. I'll, I'll have a sit down. Anita's there. Please, please Come in here, Anita. <laughs> She's the one you've got to blame. Nobody very curious for a minute. Give Silla a wave. I'm Give embarrassed. I mean, don't be. Like no, you look lovely, Hilda. But Anita has told us that you've always wanted to fly an aeroplane in a very unusual way. Yes. What's that? I want to stand on the wing. A wing walk. You want to do a wing walk? Yes. Now, are you sure you know what you're getting yourself into here, yes. Hilda? Definitely. Well, Hilda, I must tell you, we've got the aeroplane, we've got the strap for you, we've got your flying suit, you're going for a wing walk. Brilliant. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm not pulling your leg. You're going to do That's it, Hilda. fantastic. Is that all right? So Absolutely you, fantastic. You don't need your hair done, because it'll be a bit of a mess after all. <laughs> so we'll get the curls out, shall we? All right. Please. Can we get these out? Let me see them. Please you put a lot in here, don't you, Anita? Come on, give us a hand with these. Oh, my here we are, Hilda. This is Cywell Airport. We've actually got two aeroplanes for you. That one at the back, the one with one wing. Yeah. That's a little chipmunk, and that will be actually following or ahead of you or whatever. That will be watching you from another angle. Quiet with that. And then we've got, mind you, we are as an airfield. <laughs> then we've got this one, which is a tiger moth. And there's, yeah. that's where you'll be standing up there, where that handsome young man with the red coat is. And yes. what, that, what they're doing, they're just finishing off setting up the mounting for the camera that will be looking straight in your face. Because we want all those sort of reaction things. Actually, your, the two pilots today are from the Barnstormers, so you're in very good hands. All right. I'm sure I, I must. I must tell you, I've never known anyone look forward to anything so much as Hilda is to this. She's been telling us all the time. So your final preparation, your hat. Thank you. Goggles. Headset, because you should be able to talk to each other if it all works. Okay. All right. right. I Anita, I hope you won't put those on. Yeah. <laughs> Any minute now. Hilda, you're all trussed up and ready to go. I certainly am. All right, Ross, could you start the engines and you're away, Hilda? <laughs> the people look like ants. Well, they should do. You haven't taken off yet. There's ants. <laughs> Absolutely. 
there's our daredevil Hilda safely down to earth again. There she is in the audience. My goodness me. Now, I know you enjoyed it, Hilda, but would you do it all again? I would like to, but perhaps do a loop the loop. Loop the loop. <laughs> You're a braver woman than I am. Well done, Hilda. Thank you. Well, now, here's someone whose feet are firmly on the ground. Yes, it's our very own Gordon Burns. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we start this section hoping to achieve a first. Joe Thorne got in touch with us to tell how he tracked down every member except one of the Lancaster bomber in which he was the upper gunner during the war. The man he can't find is flight engineer W.S. Fred Hobson. Joe believes if he can find Fred, it will be the first time that a whole crew has been traced. He gave me all the details when I went to see him recently. I was a mid-upper gunner with Lancaster bomber XYC Charlie named Champagne Charlie after the show running in London starring Tommy Trinder. Three and a half years ago, I thought it would be nice to try and locate the rest of my crew, who I flew 31 missions with, out of ni with 90 Squadron and 186 Squadron out of Stratosaur and Tudnam. Having located five of the crew now, I would like, if possible, for the flight engineer who flew with us to contact me. One said Fred Hobson. If you're out there, Fred, please would you contact us as it would make a wonderful reunion. Yeah, it would be great if the whole crew could get together again after such a long time. So come on, Fred Hobson, ring us. Now, Ivy Harvey, whose maiden name was Lee, sent me this picture. Ivy, or Jean as she was known in the 1930s, is the little lady circled in blue. She belonged to Peggy O'Farrell's Tiny Tappers. The troupe was based in the east end of London at West Ham. Ivy would very much like to contact some of her old dancing pals. Their names are Iris Robinson, Doreen Kelly, Mary Morris, Edie Hill, Daisy Newth, Anna Good and Betty Smith. So girls, get tapping. On the telephone, that is, as Ivy would love a chat. Now take a look at this picture of Anthony Brown when he was just five in 1962. If his mum's watching, I'm sure she's leapt out of her seat. Anthony, who used to live in Swanton Drive, Wimbledon, hasn't seen her since 1964 when they had a day out at Battersea Fun Fair together. So Anne Francis Brown, your son Anthony, now 34, is desperate to find you again, so please ring us. And finally, Searchline has been asked to help, and I quote, a very special mum. That mum is Mrs. Irene Tolmy, whose maiden name was Smith, and her daughter, Shelley, wrote to us saying what tremendous support her mum had given her through some tough times, and she wanted to repay her by finding her mother's childhood friend. That friend was Mrs. Dot Ingram from Chatham in Kent. Dot and Irene Smith lost contact after Irene got married and went on honeymoon to Scotland for a week. Well, that was the intention. In fact, she stayed 18 months. Some honeymoon. So Dot Ingram, once of Chatham, but who may now be living in the north, here's the number to ring for you or anyone else who can help with tonight's stories. 071 8070 And our researchers will answer those calls until 10 o'clock tonight. Or you can write to us at Searchline, surprise, surprise, London Weekend Television, South Bank TV Centre, London SE 99, 6YW. I will see you hopefully next week, and you too, Scylla. Oh, thanks a lot, Gordon. We will see you next week, but don't rush off just yet because I need you. <laughs> don't get too excited. <laughs> it's a cue for our next song, and here to sing it are Daniel O'Donnell and Sharon Bunting. <laughs>
you Sean because it is a bit daunting really to throw you in with your idol and she adores this man <laughs> Daniel I think she did ever so well don't she you Daniel? She was super super absolutely <laughs> absolutely super how was it for you? <laughs> <laughs> you're glad it's all over really aren't you? <laughs> well Sean I thought you did great well done and it's very big thanks to Daniel O'Donnell ladies and thank gentlemen you. thank you very much Well, now it's time for something a little different. Tonight we're going to have a live satellite link up with Sydney, Australia. But before we go to the satellite, I need two people sitting right here in our audience to come and join me. Two sisters, in fact. Yes, surprise, surprise, it's you, Pat Statham and Jan Hopkins. Come on, Pat. Come on, Jan. Please come and join me. <laughs> Yes. Hello, Jan. Hello, Pat. Hello, Welcome to Surprise Surprise. Jan, will you sit next to me and Pat? You sit next to your sister. Now, I have to tell everybody, Jan here wrote me the most marvellous, moving letter. This is a surprise to you. Tell me all about you girls. Now, take your mind back, well, it was 36, you wrote to me and told me 36 years ago, when you two girls here were very, very young, your mum became, well, quite ill with cancer. Mm -hmm. So yes. much so that, uh, well, your sister here and indeed your other sister and your two elder brothers, Peter and Tony, were put into care. You were sent to homes, yes. weren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Well, then three years later, after your mother recovered, uh, your mother took the girls back. But by this time, of course, your two brothers, Peter and Tony, had already been sent by Bernardo's to live in Australia. Mm -hmm. That's right. yeah. Now, you, your mother obviously kept in, in touch with the lads and... Uh, when your Tony was 18, your mother phoned him up, got in touch with him and said, find us a big house because we're all coming over, we're going to emigrate over there, we're going to be one big happy family again. And then when she went for a medical, the, the tragic news came that uh, not only she couldn't pass the medical, but the cancer did return, didn't it? Yeah, that's sure. And she had to phone t Tony again, or write to Tony, contact him, and say, well, we can't come over. But the thing is, she couldn't, there to tell him the reason why. Anyway, sadly, your mum died, and a few years later, when your Peter found out the real reason why you all couldn't go over there, he contacted you, and that's the whole reason why you two girls are here tonight, because you're going to speak to your brothers, hopefully, <laughs> in Sydney, Australia. And with a bit of luck, they should be coming on the screen right now. 
Hopefully. And there they are. Hello, lads. Hi. Hi, Stella. Now, pl please tell me, um, in introduce me, which one's Tony and which one's Peter? I'm Tony. Sarah. Hi, Tony. I'm Peter. And I, Peter. Well, there they are, girls. Jan, isn't it lovely to see the lads again? Can Any you see us? Pardon? Can they see us? Well, ask him. Yeah. Can you see us? Yeah. Yeah, my Lord. <laughs> Hello. How are you? Hi. We're fine, yeah. How are How's you? All the <laughs> I think I think Pat's completely gobsmacked over here. <laughs> but you know, this is a very this is a very late night for them or an early morning. I mean, what time is it there, boys? Oh, nearly six. How are you both? How is everything? Oh, fine. Family's well. Yeah. How's your family? Yes, they're all getting on okay, fine. Good. How are the Good. girls? How's how are they all? Oh, they're oh. fine, yeah. You know, coping. Gosh, <laughs> this is all very daunting as well, isn't it? All those miles and miles where it's quite amazing. I know Pat is just sitting there. I know it was all kept a secret from you, Pat. But just think, I mean, this is 12,000 miles away, these boys are, and I think they look ever so well. Now, talking of the few words that you did say on the satellite there, I mean, it, it sounded as if that they really were just round the corner speaking to you. Yeah. Well, surprise, surprise, they are. I can't stand this any longer, though. They're here from Australia. Here's your brothers, Tony and Peter. Come in, We've run out of time again. I'd like to thank everyone who's taken part in tonight's show, especially our own Gordon Burns and, of course, the lovely Bob Carlgees. We'll be back next week with lots more surprises. So until then, ta then. ta Surprise, surprise is back again next Friday night at the same time, 8 o'clock.